Good. How are you? Good. I'm just getting settled back in here. I my, know. I think my second. Is That's better. <laughs> Another cup of tea. Doing the positioning. All good. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. It's three o'clock. Let's uh, let's get this started. <laughs> So uh, hi, everybody, everyone, everybody. Um, thanks for being here with us today. Um, I'm Nicole Burish. I'm the Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art at the National Gallery of Canada. And uh, this week, we're continuing um, our special series, uh, NGC Huxland Live, um, uh, that sees the uh, curators from the National Gallery um, in conversation with uh, some of our fellow colleagues, some of our fellow curators, um, right in time for your afternoon coffee break. Um, so we'll be here every Thursday at 3 o'clock in English at 13h en français. Uh, so pour yourself a cup of your favorite drink and uh, join us here. Um, so uh, today I am joined by uh, my dear colleague, uh, Jen Zolnier, who's the Conservator of Contemporary Art at the National Gallery of Canada. Hi, Jen. How are you? Oh. <laughs> Good. Oh. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, I think we're okay. We're having a little delay, but it's fine. okay. We'll go slow. Um, so Jen and I are going to have a little chat here. Uh, we'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions from you. So, um, or, you know, if you have questions that sort of come up during those 20 minutes, uh, feel free to throw them in the comment section and we'll uh, revisit those towards the end of our time here today. Um, so in keeping with a little uh, thing that we started last week, um, Jonathan and I were here last week and uh, we were talking a bit about space and we were talking a bit about um, sort of being in our houses, uh, sort of thinking about the objects that we live with. Uh, I'm going to continue our little ritual here today and ask uh, you, Jen, uh, what are you drinking today and what uh, what cup are you drinking it out of? Okay, so I just got hot water and honey, but I'm drinking it and oh, the light is not good, but it's a beautiful mug by a local artist. Uh, her name is Michelle McDonald. And yeah. And what about you? Right on. Um, I've got uh, like same the same tea I was drinking before, but like refreshed uh, <laughs> out of a, a mug by uh, an American uh, ceramic artist, uh, Missy McCormick. Uh, it's one of my favorites. I drink out of this one a lot. Um, so that's great. We're all ready. We're set to go. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be chatting uh, a bit about Jen and what she does. And I think um, with Jen and about Jen, uh, like a lot of people, um, I think I'm really, uh, I'm really fascinated by uh, like what a conservator does. I think it's one of those jobs that sort of holds a certain intrigue for people. Um, and I know that you have to, you know, you have to know stuff about art uh, and about art history, um, but you also maybe have to know like science and maybe some chemistry. Um, so I'd be curious to know a little bit about your the training that you that you did to get into this job and sort of your career path to to sort of land here. Okay, so I do have a background in chemistry and uh, um, art history as well and fine arts. Uh, in order to become an art conservator a master's degree in art conservation and that's what I did at Queen's University which is the only university in Canada that offers the program and then uh, when you enroll in the program you have you have to uh, know from the beginning if you want to become a paintings conservator or an object conservator or a paper conservator or a conservation scientist and then that what I enrolled in was uh, paintings conservation. Uh, I became a contemporary art conservator uh, throughout the years um, by training, but also just a community, accumulating uh, experience. So it's not something you could specialize in in uh, university. It's something you sort of build up through through practice, the contemporary art part. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and so could you, uh, yeah, like, I'd be curious to hear some more about um, sort of what your your roles and responsibilities are, like, what does a typical day look like for you? Uh, what kind of things do you work on? You know? Yeah, uh, well, uh, activities are based, uh, well, my workload is based on the activities of the gallery. Um, they look 
works like uh, I'm processing or condition reporting artworks uh, or for loan or for exhibition, in-house exhibition or for acquisitions. And what that entails is uh, me going or in the storage areas to examine the artworks or bring them in my lab. Uh, where I look at them carefully and just to make sure that they're in good condition to be put on exhibition or to travel. Uh, from there, I do recommendations for traveling, uh, like, uh, like recommendations for creating. Uh, and also, I have a question, or like we, we talk with the borrowing institutions just to make sure that they can really accommodate the artwork that they're asking for um, because sometimes contemporary art can be very large and it requires like very high ceilings or the crates are so big we have to make sure they can go through the doors uh, to get to the, the place where they want to show them so it's all basically like making sure that all the logistics and lending artworks is like basically totally covered yeah, and very much about thinking, so in that case, it's sort of about thinking um, about the specific place that the artwork is going to and the conditions of that of that gallery, like it's in relation to specific uh, spaces. Yeah, it is. And, um, and you know, sometimes we, we have to be careful um, and, and, and we miss um, some little details. Uh, as an example, uh, I had the opportunity to travel to go and install an artwork and uh, it was a big drawing by Kiki Smith. And uh, when we were putting it on the wall, I realized that there was an air vent just right underneath it. And as we were installing it, the paper was like basically floating as the air was coming out of the air vent. Um, so we did troubleshoot that. We heard the air vent and actually closed the airflow. Um, but yeah, we, we, we do have like the, the, the specific space where Going, has some repercussions like on the safety of the artwork yeah and so not just space but also things like air condition and and air vent circulations and um, and light levels too I think you would mentioned that that before as well so there's like a whole set of, of conditions that that are sort of need to be in place to, to have those objects on display mm -hmm. um, yeah and you sort of get to, to keep an eye on that um, I was thinking too, you had mentioned sort of acquisitions and, and that's an area that you and I uh, work uh, on together when we're acquiring works of art. And for me, it's always been a really um, uh, exciting part of the process of acquisition where um, I may be researching sort of the, the artist and maybe some art historical context and I might be talking with the artist about, you know, the, the concepts behind the work. Um, well, at the same time, you'll be working on the condition report. And then often when I get the condition report, it'll be this beautiful extra set of information about um, how the work was made and the very specific materials and how they've put together. Um, and sometimes that can really inform how I'm thinking about an artwork or how I come to understand an artist's uh, process. Like even if I'm already talking with them about that, um, sometimes the condition report can really bring this amazing extra set of knowledge. So it's something I really appreciate. Yeah, well, I think that's where like when we like whatever work you do actually like I, I actually bring something else like we're basically making like a big package that is about the artwork itself like uh when you focus on 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 whatever you said I focus on the object itself and uh when I do acquisition reports it's not only examining the artwork to see if it's in good condition because it's obviously probably going to be because it's so new um, but I'm more interested about what type of material and the techniques uh, that were used by the artists. So I do artist interviews and I ask a lot of questions about the provenance of the materials that they use, uh, where did it, they buy them, when, and like you said, sometimes that brings like a little bit more information about the artwork that's also uh, related uh, to the semantic uh, of it. And yeah, I really like that part. Um, and I mean, in that kind of uh, conversation that you're having with artists, um, I know that another role that uh, conservators can kind of play is to, to kind of consult with artists about even the creation of their artworks. Um, so could you tell us a bit about that? Um, consult with the artists? Yeah, well, 
there's, there's, it happened uh, that like the National Gallery uh, in the past actually commissioned artworks that weren't even done. Uh, and so when that happened, we work closely with the artists, like just to make sure that uh, it, it's of the best construction and of the best materials. Um, but also when the artworks is already already done, um, we, we, we try to, to work the, with the artists, like so they actually can provide the best version of something. Um, like I'm especially thinking about Tempe's media. Uh, there's so many different formats that the work can uh, be uh, like uh, um, saved on and so we work with the artist to basically create a format that is the best long-term preservation format that is available for the artwork yeah like it's really about this kind of longevity and having something that'll last you know not just for the audience today but also for this sort of audience yeah for all time as long as possible yeah um, yeah it started, it started okay. from the beginning because it's also once the artist has created an artwork often like if we come back to him uh, or her in 10 years asking for another version or another format um, sometimes there's little interest in in, in participating in that because they have so many other things to do <laughs> yeah yeah so it's neat if you start at the beginning with materials or that that kind of consultation it can sort of help with the the, the long term like both the creation and the conservation of the of the work um, yeah, and sort of speaking about uh, materials, um, we were talking before a bit too about, you know, I was saying I, I was, I've been really interested since working at the museum about the fact that we do have some objects that have sort of limits on uh, how long they can be shown. So, uh, which is not a thing I've really had to think about before, but we do have some works um, that uh, um, on paper or textiles where we have sort of limits on the amount of time that, uh, that they can be shown for. Um, oh, we had someone saying that there's like a clicking noise from the mic. Is that you or is that me? I'm just gonna I don't know what that could even be. All right, uh, I'm gonna just try that. Um, sorry, everyone. Um, but yes, yeah, so the, um, yeah, that there's works that can only be up for kind of a, a smaller amount of time. Um, and that, uh, you know, there's sort of limits on on, you know, sometimes you can only have a work up for six months um, and in order to keep it from being light for too long. Yeah, well, there's materials that are more fragile than other ones. And uh, also there's materials that are not as long lasting as others. And especially um, when drawings, prints, textiles, um, the colors are not very light fast. And uh, so when we put those on the we try to limit their exposure so we preserve the colors so they don't change as fast change if we weren't taking care of it um, but at the same time with contemporary art we try to be a little bit more flexible with those rules and the reason is that when there's an artwork that contemporary artist that uh, enters the, the collection it's actually our job to promote that artwork and to promote that artist and its career so and because that object is really like the object of the moment um we wouldn't dare basically putting limitations on it um so we went a little bit we, we allow it to be positioned a little bit longer than we would um but when that comes like maybe like the artist has production and it's the other production that we so then just put it in storage and let it rest for a bit longer. Yeah, so that's a, I like this idea too of, of objects that sort of are, um, yeah, of the time and giving more space to those uh, immediately, which is a thing that as contemporary art uh, conservators and, and curators, we have to pay attention to. And then letting the objects have a little rest before it, before it comes back again. Um, yeah, I think that's a nice a nice way of thinking about caretaking and objects in a museum as well. Um, so maybe we can, uh, we've been talking a bit too about different materials and uh, as we know, uh, contemporary art is often not just uh, painting or sculpture, 
Um, it can also be made out of lots of different materials. Sometimes it can be ephemeral, it can be plastic, it can be found objects. So um, I'm wondering if you could tell us maybe about um, uh, some interesting materials or interesting projects you've worked on that kind of uh, yeah, encountering of, of sort of unusual materials. Um, yes, well, there's often very unusual materials because uh, artists are creative, not only in their messages, but the techniques and in and, and whatever material that we use. Um, there's one example that I really like, and it's uh, of a restoration project we did, uh, and it's uh, by Baxter. Uh, it's a work of art that's called That Trick. And it's a sculpture, and it has a skinned, pretty Ruxpin doll mm -hmm. that is animated and is reciting a text. And um, for the years, um, all the mechanical parts started wearing and uh, it wasn't working properly. And uh, so in order to repair it, uh, we had to go on eBay and actually purchase Teddy Ruxpins as replacement part. Um, but as we bought the first one, we realized that um, we really had to purchase the same serial number as the original one from the artwork um, because it parts from uh, versions that are older or earlier were very different aesthetically so we couldn't use it. and so now we have a collection of five um, <laughs> uh, that are skinned uh, because there was no point in, in keeping all the fur uh, and that's sitting in my spare park uh, room in the lab waiting to be used. <laughs> I really like that. Yeah, that it's not just about buying one replacement part, it's about having this whole sort of backup set that you bought, uh, a sort of bulk purchase in the case of uh, future uh, replacement or repair needs as well. Um, yeah. yeah, well, it, it's also because those those parts are going to be become uh, more and more rare, and there will be a point where we won't be uh, to, to, to purchase them anymore. So we usually do that. Uh, of the artwork, the spare parts as well. Uh, spare parts that we will foresee that won't be in the future. Yeah, and it's also about um, sort of keeping with the technology of the time that the work was actually created. Um, I know you were talking a bit about a Michael Snow work earlier, where that's also kind of came into play. Yeah, well, um, it's not only the preservation of the object. Uh, we like to preserve the historical context uh, in which the object was created. Um, a very simple example is a 1970 video. Uh, we wouldn't show it on a flat screen TV as an example because it doesn't work. You're removing the historical context. So the preservation of the artwork, not only about the artwork itself, but it's also about like all the surrounding material that is necessary to present, like all the playback equipment. Um, we do that when it's necessary to preserve the historical context. It's not only some artworks uh, according to the artist's intent should, you know, like they should be digitized or they should be shown on different platforms. Uh, but most of the time we try to preserve um, the initial look uh, of the artwork. Uh, recently, uh, we just uh, finished a very long restoration project of an artwork by Mexico. Um It's called The Law, and it's uh, it's a big camera exhibit. It's, ro it's robotic, um, and it's basically a big arm with a camera that's uh, fixed at the end of it, and it does and as it rotates, it basically films its around. And over the years, it stopped working. And so we understood the duration of it, and we had to um, hire those like two fantastic engineers uh, who were able to figure it out uh, for us and refurbish it. Um, and but what that brings me. <laughs> However, is that when you work with external contractor, you have to 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 keep an eye on them, uh, especially with technology based, because they want to make it look better and they want to make it work better than it used to be. But we try to basically 
observe what the object, what its essence was uh, from when we purchased it. That's very cool. Um, I'm curious too about, um, yeah, like we were saying, contemporary can include lots of different materials and um, and also I think about, you know, the world we're in where people are constantly inventing new materials. Um, so what happens when you encounter an artwork um, made out of something that you've never seen before? Uh, that happens often. Um, we have to be extremely humble <laughs> and uh, ask questions, basically. We do a lot of research. Uh, we're inspectors. Um, when we come across the type of plastic we've never seen before, as an example, uh, we'll call the manufacturers and we'll very, very nicely ask for what the, the recipes are and the creation process is. And when we get that type of information, or as most as we can, um, then because of our uh, chemistry background, we can figure out how this object is going to age uh, over time. Yeah, yeah. That's so neat. Like the kind of yeah, like you could bring your training forward uh, to sort of encounter and um, understand objects and and new technologies as they come in. Um, so we're at about uh, twenty after three now, and I'm gonna open up and invite any questions from the public. Um, and I'm also I think I saw one go flying by earlier in the in the thing. I apologize about the clicking noises. I don't know what that is. Um, I'm going to see if I can pull up one of those. And also, if people have other questions, please feel free uh, to do that. So we have one here from Diane uh, and Mile, and it asks, the assembly of art blueprint uh, supplied by the artist or under artist supervision? Um, so I'm, I think that uh, maybe they're asking sort of uh, like if there's instructions for how to assemble an artwork or install an artwork. Does that come from the artist or how does that arrive from the artist? Uh, uh, most of the time we do get uh, assembly instructions from artists. Um, sometimes uh, those assembly instructions are very complex and uh, but also they they are they they ask for interpretation and uh, when we acquire an artwork we obviously don't have the knowledge or the experience with the artwork as much as the artists do uh, to install it on our own. So what we'll do is that we invite the artists to come and install it with us. And this is like very like a joint effort from all departments, from like all the gallery, like curators, there's uh, all our installation technician department, design. So we all work together with the artists to understand it and the goal is ultimately for the art the artist to um, trust us in being able to do subsequent installations on our own yeah I think that uh, there's this sort of yeah what we build are sort of files about each artwork that often include these installation documents and they're they're incredibly detailed and you know there's diagrams and uh, it's this other sort of facet to an artwork that um, is really important and interesting too. Um, I have another question here from uh, Jamie Morris. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, and Jamie asks uh, and says, I've had the pleasure of working with both of you at the NGC. That's the educator for Indigenous programs. Um, and Jen, sometimes you work with Indigenous artworks. And perhaps you could tell us about an interesting example of, of one of those. Um, yeah. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of those examples. Uh, as most of you know, like uh, we we put up that beautiful um, exhibition about our Kune, Continuel, Continuous Fire, um, that is a quinquennial of international ind indigenous art. And uh, that was extremely special. It's the second edition. We had one, uh, the, the first one, five years ago. And uh, I have to say that it was very enlightening because the 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 meaning behind the materials that are used, but the process also of creating artworks uh, is I find that it's often um, a lot a lot more important um, than the artwork. There's also um, the aspect of the community, and uh, but also that the artwork is like something alive and special. So there's a lot more coming 
is part of the artwork and when and I think it's going to change a lot on how we're going to look at how we're going to preserve those artworks and how we're going to conserve those artworks. Yeah, that's a good why well, two follow up questions also coming from our fantastic audience that I think uh, relate here. Um, and maybe I'll give you the questions together because I think they, they do kind of relate. Um, Jonathan is asking about what conservators call inherent vice. Um, and then Monique is asking about uh, works like the Joy Arcand one that we have uh, installed on the, the ramp right now that's on the floor. Um, that's and asking about what happens to works like that where the public uh, might walk on those and how does that get preserved or maintained? Okay. Uh, on the question of inherent vice, uh, well, it's, it's a flaw that an artwork has and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, but except for taking extra care of it, um, maybe protecting it a little bit more when it's on exhibition. Um, there's works with inner advice that uh, we still show. Um, but like I said, we just take uh, extra precaution when we put them on exhibition. As for works of art like uh, that's an interesting one because it's a work um, that we don't preserve, uh, basically. We won't do anything about it. Uh, the vinyl is going to get changed when it gets a little bit too damaged. Uh, we do ask the artist, though, uh, when is it too damaged for you? Because there's some artworks that should get damaged as well, and that's where I need to back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stop my um. cleaning. And, uh, but uh, the work by Joy, Basically, we have a digital file and printing instructions um, from her um, for this one in particular, because it's a work that has to uh, be in situ um, and it means responding to the environment that it is. Uh, we will always consult with Joy uh, about the font size, also the color distance between the lettering and things like that. Yeah. It's uh, we have a couple works like that too that um, that are created anew each time. Uh, and these are maybe in some sense these are the conservators' dream. They never do get damaged. They get sort of, uh, or they might get damaged a little bit when they're installed. But they, yeah, we have instructions for conceptual artworks or um, wallpaper works where the wallpaper gets printed on demand and installed um, each time. So. There's still conservation work around those, though, I find interesting, like conservators are still involved in the process of acquiring those kinds of works. Yeah, well, like the digital files have to be preserved, um, basically. So, so there is some type of conservation associated with those works. Yeah. Um, we have uh, some other questions here. Um, uh, Liam uh, Murphy asks, how do you collaborate with other national galleries with pertinent exhibitions? Uh, which is a great question. I think this might be about collaborating with other institutions too. To do exhibitions? Um, or maybe uh, other national galleries with pertinent exhibitions. Um, or maybe, I, maybe how, like, how do conservators collaborate across, uh, like, across galleries? Oh, yeah, well, um, there is, a, we do borrow artworks from other institutions to put in our exhibitions and the, the same the other way, we lend artworks to other institutions. Um, we usually take care of our works before we send them, but it does happen once in a while that we receive an artwork uh, and it has a little bit of damage and it needs an intervention. So we'll offer restoration um, just so we put the artwork in its splendor in the art gallery. Like we wouldn't put something damaged. Um, but we do have like an exchange program with other institutions. And it's not only national museums. We do that with smaller institutions, um, artist run centers sometimes as well. Thanks. Um, there was a, a great question that came in in French chat that I'm going to ask you again, because it was so good, um, which is how do you keep up to date uh, with developments in the field? Um, yeah, uh, well, there's, there's, there's associations um, that we're part of. Uh, there's like uh, the, the 
Canadian Conservation Institute, which is a facility that's here in Ottawa, which and with which we have like a special relationship. And uh, they do a lot of research, basically. And when we come across materials, like you asked earlier, uh, that we're not accustomed to, uh, often we can ask them to do analysis on those artworks uh, and those materials to provide us some information, which is great. And otherwise, like we, um, we do uh, formation, formation. Trainings, yeah. <laughs> yeah, trainings. And there's conferences, uh, there's, there's newsletters that like constantly come, go out. Um, the conservation community is pretty active and it's really based on sharing information. So that's how we keep today. Yeah, that's super cool. Like I was thinking about how, yeah, like probably 20 years ago when plastic was a new material, people were like, oh, what do we do with this? But now there's maybe this, this sort of bank of information that's developed around particular materials that then get sort of shared through, through this extended network of, of conservators. Yeah, yeah. When something is very new. There's no textbooks on how to, to preserve those things, but we can often just do like the minimum to make them last until there are solutions that are published. Um, so we can do interventions. That's great. That's a very nice note to end on about collaboration and togetherness and sharing. <laughs> unless there's any other questions. Um, we were also, we're gonna invite, um, if anyone has questions about how to take care of the art objects in your home, um, you're invited to submit those um, either through the Instagram account or through Facebook. Um, and Jen and I will see if we can gather some of those and maybe do a future episode where we can talk about, um, yeah, sort of some, some conservators tips for how to take care of, you know, did you break your, your favorite cup and you want to know how to fix it, uh, stuff like that. So we'll see if we can gather enough questions to, to have Jen back on at some point, because I think this, is, this has been super fun. It's been so nice having you here. <laughs> um, and thanks to everyone who submitted questions and showed up and um, thanks also to our team at the gallery who helped us uh, make this uh, possible. It's a whole bunch of people that uh, were pitching in. Um, and I invite you to tune in again next Thursday uh, in English at 3 and in French at 1 uh, if you'd like uh, some more House Blend Live. Oh, here we go. We have one last minute question. Are you up for it? <laughs> it's uh, how do you address fiber art, especially made with wool? Oh, Jesus. I can't let that one go. <laughs> no, you can't let that one go. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be very honest. I, I, I'm not a fiber art expert, uh, but we do have fiber art experts in our lab. Um, it's um, like we have Sheila, uh, who's our decorative art like conservator. And uh, with those, I think we, we treat them uh, just like as any other light, fast, object like they can be damaged by light um, but one extra precaution we have to make is basically they're like excellent food for pests so these works have to be extra protected especially when they're in storage um, they need to be sealed and so so they don't get in, uh, infested because it could happen um, but uh, but how do we care for them they're usually rolled um, that's how we travel them and uh, and when they're put on exhibition, sometimes they'll go in vitrines, depending if they're very fragile. Yeah, and sometimes they'll get frozen uh, or or uh, fumigated as they come into the museum too, right? Uh, with textiles. Yes, yes. Uh, there's there's like a we do have like a pest policy um, where like everything that is like organic has to be through go through fumigation when it enters the gallery, uh, and um, so those wool and most textiles are okay to be frozen as a treatment uh, but not all of them it's really on a case-by-case -case basis yeah that's great uh, I visited the textile museum recently and got to see their collection and it's all these incredible sort of rolls of of uh, rugs they have an amazing set of those so it's kind of a sort of becomes like these banks it almost looks like a fabric store but also a museum <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways okay on that note, we'll wrap it up and uh, hope to see you again uh, next week, everyone. And thanks so much, Jen, for, for doing this with me. Remember to save the video when you're done. <laughs> I will do that. Okay.
Bye, everyone. <laughs>